Harrison Taggart makes it official. He will be a BYU Cougar. We're talking about the impact he possibly could have for BYU as soon as this fall. And also, the Big 12 remains expansion-minded based on their comments from Friday. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Appreciate you guys being a part of it and being an everydayer with us here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Just a reminder that we are your only original daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. And today's title sponsors are friends over at FanDuel. This episode is brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. All right, diving right in on today's show. we got plenty to cover ahead, but obviously big news over the weekend. Saturday night, Harrison Taggart, the former Corner Canyon star, announcing that he will uh, play for the BYU football program. Had originally uh, gone to Oregon, uh, played there sparingly as a freshman, and now comes to BYU with four years of eligibility remaining to play for the Cougars. The one thing I like about this is he adds to an already impressive group of linebackers for BYU. Now, Harrison probably needs to put on some weight, I think, I, I feel like at least, personally personally to be the uh, type of linebacker that BYU probably envisions him being. But the nice part is he has got what they call pure, unadulterated speed. He was uh, tracked in the 100-meter dash as recently as his junior year in high school, running a 10.69-second 100-meter 100 100 uh, dash. That's an incredibly fast number. That's among the tops in the state of Utah in its history. This is a guy who can absolutely fly. And by the way, he did it while weighing more than most guys do, playing safety, linebacker, that type of stuff at Corner Canyon. He wasn't your fleet-footed uh, wide receiver type of a deal. He was a more bulky athlete, but he's got great, great speed. Now, the the kind of the, the issue with him is most people, Oregon included, thought he was more of what they call a tweener, where he wasn't necessarily as fleet of foot maybe to play on the defensive backfield side of things, but also at the same time probably needed to pack on some extra poundage uh, onto a six-foot or six-foot-one frame, depending on which roster you look at, to play linebacker. I think BYU will find a spot for him no, no matter what. The one thing I know about Jay Hill is he he likes athletes, and he will find a role for those athletes to succeed in his defense. So I have got no doubt that a guy like Harrison Taggart will be utilized uh, to his strengths in BYU's system. Now, my biggest issue with this whole situation involving Harrison Taggart, and I, you're probably wondering, what, what issue do you have, Jay? was the fact that it took Harrison Taggart leaving the state, going to Oregon, deciding he was homesick and Oregon wasn't the spot for him, for him to finally essentially get a sniff of attention from the BYU football program. I do not understand for the life of me. This was a kid who was thought to be a high-level four-star prospect playing at Corner Canyon High School, a place that you have plucked plenty of talent out of if you're BYU. Think of Zach Wilson. Think of Cody Hagan. Think of Owen Borg. Think of all the names that have come out of the Chargers football program in the last four to five years years and this guy this guy you just don't offer this is an indictment on the former BYU defensive staff. The fact that they felt like, you know what, we're we're going to just go after our guys. Uh, Jeff Hansen over on Give Him Hell Brigham did a really, really good, he calls it the Daily Dose. He has a really uh, fun podcast, quick uh, topic in and out, really. It's a, it's a unique uh, product in the BYU podcast sphere, and I would encourage you, ch- encourage you guys to check it out. And a really good piece on uh, the perception of BYU's coaches then versus now from the perspective of high school coaches he's in community communication with. And that in the, in part of that, one of those daily doses, he talked about the fact that BYU's old staff, the defensive staff in particular, led by Elisa Tuiaki, Ed Lamb, on down the list, they, in most circumstances, if the guy that they offered or they were potentially going to offer got an offer or offers from other programs, they essentially just like backed off. Where in the world is the fight? Where is the desire to go out and fight, scratch, and claw to bring guys, talented guys, into your program? BYU's defensive woes over the past few years can be uh, pointed directly, in my mind, to the lack of talent overall that they have brought in on the recruiting front. BYU, for some reason, Ed Lamb's philosophy was to get long, rangy uh, athletes who had the height, weight, speed combo that you wanted and bring them in and fit them into your, into your defense. It didn't work. 
Honestly, we all know this. It did not work, and that's why they don't have jobs at BYU any longer. The thing about this is, if that's the case, why in the world wasn't a rangy athlete who had incredible speed, maybe not necessarily the requisite size to play linebacker, why wasn't a guy like Harrison Taggart a guy that BYU was after? Uh, for the life of me, I don't understand it. 30-plus offers from around the country, but one of the schools in his literal proverbial backyard does not even give him a sniff of attention. Thank goodness for Jay Hill, Justin Enna, Kelly Papinga on down the list of this new staff for BYU for re-engaging with Harrison Taggart and winning out in the end. He wanted to come home to Utah. Obviously, he mentioned that his family is moving to Tennessee, but he said that Utah was home to him. He wanted to play closer to his family and friends. Obviously, he's going to have former teammates on the roster with him in Provo. It is a great opportunity for a guy like Harrison Taggart to come to BYU and take on a bigger role in BYU's defense. Will he start day one? No, I don't think he starts day one, but there is a very real possibility that he is at least a, a, in the two deep for BYU this season and I could imagine a scenario that maybe by midseason he proves good enough in this defense if he picks it up fast enough that he could end up being a starter for BYU. The one thing I have noticed during spring camp about BYU's linebackers, I'm thinking more of the younger guys. I'm thinking of like Ace and Micah Kafusi, uh, Isaiah Glasker, etc. They are not necessarily prototypical linebacker bodies. They're, they're tall. They're not necessarily the, the thickest guys out there. But the one thing they all can do is they can run. They can go sideline to sideline and make plays. That is what a guy like Harrison Taggart, I think, is tailor-made for. I think he's going to come in and make a very good impression in BYU's defense. And by the way, those those young guys, they're always going to be battling for playing time with guys like a Max Tooley, like a Ben Bywater, and obviously A.J. Vongpachan, the transfer in from Utah State. So there is a number of guys in BYU's linebacking core that are going to try and make an impression during training camp this summer. But the nice part is you now have options. It felt like that was one of the position groups that might have been a little bit light in terms of overall talent coming out of spring camp. Well, when you add a four-year sensation at Utah State and A.J. Vongpachan and now a four-star prospect in, uh, in Harris and Taggart to that mix, I think you have bolstered that position group quite nicely. Now, BYU has added 20-plus transfer portal targets this offseason alone, and I'm not going to lie, every single one of them to me has upside that I think is going to be beneficial for the BYU football program. i got to give this recruiting uh, staff, I'm speaking of the coaches, the behind-the-scenes guys that handle the recruiting side of things, I'm thinking of uh, Tyler Anderson uh, and those guys that are behind the scenes. All of them deserve a round of applause. They've done a fantastic job trying to help BYU shore up their positions out there uh, as much as they possibly can. Could there still be a body or two that are added to the roster this summer going into training camp? Absolutely. They still have room to bring in more bodies. But the good news is if you're a BYU fan is that they are continuing to do work on the transfer portal. And Harrison Taggart uh, is just another just kind of another hit in a long run of BYU having a fantastic offseason of transfer portal stuff. But like I said, the only thing that bugs me about this is why in the world wasn't this guy a cougar from the get-go? That, that That's literally the only thing about this that is a negative in my mind. And that just goes more to an indictment of the previous coaching staff. But uh, nonetheless, it is a really really nice addition for BYU's roster. Like I said, Taggart's going to be highly motivated coming in. He's played and practiced and worked out in a top-level Power 5 program already, so he understands what it's going to take to, su to succeed Excuse me, at the Power 5 levels. BYU goes into the Big 12, and the nice part is his sister, Madeline, also a standout track and field athlete at uh, Corner Canyon, is going to be joining him on campus at BYU. So BYU women's track and field gets a high-level athlete in their own right to add to their uh, stockpile of talent. So uh, family dynamic at play here obviously but in the end I think all's well that ends well and Harrison Taggart is going to be a BYU Cougar. Now the Big 12 obviously is continuing to look at all of its options when it comes to expansion Brett Yormark and Lawrence Skuvenick who is the Texas Tech president also the, the president of the Big 12 board of directors they spoke to the media on Friday after the Big 12 wrapped up spring meetings I've been kind of mulling over what they talked about all weekend long I want to get to some of my thoughts on that as we continue on right here on Locked On Cougars. Now, a word on our friends over at FanDuel. They've been working with us for months now. The best part is make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA Finals, my friends, because right now, new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. You heard that, heard that right. $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win with our friends at FanDuel. you got great promotions that are available to you every single day on a safe and secure app that makes sure that your information is always being uh, monitored and protected. And the best part is you can get paid out instantly for 
from our friends at FanDuel is no longer having to hit a reserve amount of money to get paid out. So get over to FanDuel and check it out today. There is no better place to bet on all of the playoff and NBA Finals action than with America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get a no sweat first bet of up to one, excuse me, $2,500. Uh, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Once again, to check that out, FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen to the day. Thank you to all of you for being every dayers with us here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Uh, coming up on tomorrow's podcast, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what's going on with BYU as they look forward to the Big 12. I'm, I'm very excited to see how BYU measures up. And some of the comments uh, from Brett Yormark in particular on Friday uh, gave me a, a, just kind of a, a thought that we'll get to on tomorrow's podcast. I want to talk a little bit more about that. Obviously, we'll continue to break down all of the games in BYU's independent football history. Today we're going to talk about a blowout loss to Wisconsin. We'll get to that a little bit later on. But uh, during uh, the Big 12 spring meetings, it sounds like all things were kind of geared towards looking at the future for the Big 12. And the, what, what I mean by the future is, obviously you've got the four new members coming into the conference officially in just under a month's time. July 1, BYU joins the three other new members of the Big 12 conference. A year from then, you will see both Texas and Oklahoma exit the conference, and they'll be left with the 12 members of of the Big 12. In that time, over the next year plus, could be uh, BYU as well, as well as the rest of the Big 12 see continual additions to the Big 12 fold? Well, if you believe what Brett Yormark and Lauren Skuvenick talked about, they're going to evaluate all options, whether that's basketball only options with Gonzaga or UConn. They're obviously going to explore that venue. Uh, this is a guy, speaking of Brett Yormark, who is a basketball guy through and through. He believes that the, the basketball side of things is being severely undervalued in all this conference realignment stuff. And he, he's right on one thing, by the way. If the uh, NCAA tournament continues to pay out the amount of, um, what do they call them, the, the tournament shares, I don't remember exactly what the technical term is, but each round uh, each round you go through in the NCAA tournament, you are guaranteed a chunk of money from the NCAA for the next six years that goes back to your conference. Well, if the Big 12 uh, continues to be the preeminent basketball conference in the country, you can guarantee that adding behemoths like a Gonzaga, like a Yukon, would only make the Big 12's chances of garnering more money from the NCAA tournament that much better. And by the way, that adds more money to all of the conference members' coffers, even BYU, even if the Cougars aren't necessarily the most, uh, I guess, uh, competitive in Big 12 basketball. But the nice part of, beyond that is that they're continuing to look at all options. Uh, Brett Yormark did acknowledge that football is the driver in all of this conference expansion. We all know that there are... Uh, there is a pro rata clause out there with Fox and ESPN uh, per the reports out there that if uh, a Pac-12 school, say Arizona, Colorado, one of those were to decide that they wanted to join the Big 12 or both of them or more than that, each one of them would be guaranteed the 31 plus million dollars that is currently being guaranteed to the 12 members of the Big 12 that will be part of the conference in 2025 and beyond when this new media right still kicks in. So that is the motivation, by the way, for those schools if they're uh, thinking that hey, maybe the big the Pac-12 configuration and the overall dollar amounts that are going to come to us are going to be lower than that, you can guarantee yourself you're going to make at least $31 million from the TV rights alone. That doesn't include bowl payouts. That doesn't include the NCAA. It's tournament shares. That's what it is. I just thought of that. It came to my mind. NCAA men's basketball tournament shares that chunk of change. All that's in addition to the $31 million that's going to be guaranteed to each member's school going into that. So you can understand why there is so much conversation about, is the Pac-12 going to continue to do what they're going to do? Is Colorado going to continue maybe uh, continue to, uh, I guess, do this song and dance, do this flirtation with the Big 12? Will Arizona do the same thing? Could Arizona State uh, decide, you know what, we're going to go in lockstep with Arizona? There's so much conversation with this, and for good Good reason, and it sounds like the Big 12 is continuing to look at all options. The, the uh, comments, like I said, from Lawrence Skuvenick as well as Brett Yormark on Friday indicated they are very, very aware of what's going on out there, and I, I, I for one, appreciate that. They're trying to establish the Big 12 as the number three conference firmly behind the SEC and the Big 10 out there in terms of the prestige factor. Is it going to be easy to do that? No, because you know that there, there are those blowhards, both in the ACC as well as in the Pac-12, who are going to say, well, we still have the more storied programs. Great, but here's the thing. As you continue to work the angle with regards to pumping up your, your conference, uh, all of the rumors involving the Pac-12's demise and potentially the ACC blowing itself 
yourself up from the inside to jailbreak uh, some of their top members, there there is going to be a, just a, a nice part with the Big 12 to know that, hey, we're going to be adding to the Big 12 versus potentially seeing it blow up. And it's a kind of a, just a reversal of fortunes in just not many, it was a four or five years ago, there were very, very clear rumors that the Big 12's demise could be coming. But the Big 12 has kind of just pivoted and has now become one of those more stable uh, conferences out there. Am I saying it's completely stable? No, because let's say uh, the, the Pac-12 money comes in and they get the number that they're looking for, good on them. And that obviously would mean that the Pac-12 is going to stick together and then the Big 12 can move forward with its 12 member schools but so long as the Pac-12 continues to drag its feet if they are dragging their feet or if they just simply can't get the media rights that they're looking for continue to hear more of these stories about the Colorados and the Arizonas uh, having public flirtations with the Big 12 conference and like I said it's for good reason because Brett Yormark knows what he has to do to really uh, firm up the future of his conference. This is a guy who's just really hit the ground running. It's been very impressive to see him do his thing. Now, there was also conversation out there that potentially the Big 12 may refresh its brand, maybe continue, uh, maybe not even uh, continue to carry the Big 12 moniker as, as its conference name. Uh, they did clarify they're going to have a brand refresh next year, but the logo and the name is not going to change. So no matter if they add two, four, six teams, they're not going to be the Big 14, the Big 16, or the Big 18. They're not going to do that. They're going to stick as the Big 12 conference. Now, I, I obviously, I, I've always thought it was kind of funny that the Big Ten for so many years already had 11 teams, and now they're up to 14, going to be 16 soon enough. You know what? So be it. It's just kind of this day and age. It, it's a brand. It's a reputation that's out there in the college sports universe that it'd be hard-pressed to really kind of just give up on that Big 12 moniker. But nonetheless, for the time being at least, that, that is going to be nice, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how they refresh it a little bit. What are they going to do? What are they going to make it look like? And how will uh, the continual uh, change that they're trying to implement. Rucker Park with the basketball side of things. Uh, Brett Yormark talked uh, further about wanting to go to Mexico. He said that he promised that there was going to be more uh, uh, information coming about uh, the Big 12 programs going to Mexico City to play basketball, going to Monterey, Mexico to play football games. Uh, if I'm BYU, I'm raising my hand right away and saying, hey, we'd love to go down there because outside of the United States, most of you know this, the largest concentration of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints outside of the, the continental United States States is in Mexico. There's well north of a million members, and you can guarantee that there will be members who may not have an interest in football, but the fact that BYU is coming to their backyard, whether it's in Mexico City or if it's in Monterey or anywhere else, you would have a nice, nice crowd of native uh, Mexican uh, just BYU fans showing up there to watch the Cougars in action. So there's a lot of good things happening with the Big 12. But I'm, I'm excited to hear them continue to say, hey, we are expansion-minded. We're obviously going to be evaluating all options. Options. We're going to continue to do our thing and try and find the best options for us as a conference. And that's exactly what you should hope for if you're a BYU fan. Now, obviously, there are BYU fans out there who say that Utah shouldn't be invited to the Big 12. I've got no intel on that. I, I, I would think that BYU would not stand in the way of Utah joining the Big 12 should the Pac-12 blow up. But at the same time, it may just very well be that the the, the haughtiness, the the gumption, not, not the gumption, but like just the, 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 the tone that Utah has struck with all of this screams to me that they have little to no interest, frankly, in uh, jumping to the Big 12 of their own volition. Now, if things change around them and it's in their best interest to do that, I don't think they're going to be dumb enough to not make that jump. But so long as they can avoid it, it sure feels like the Utes don't have any interest in making that leap. All right, coming up here in just a moment, we'll flip back over, talk about some of the other topics in BYU sports. We do have an All-American citation that was handed out uh, late last week, as well as an old friend coming back to Provo. We'll talk about all of that as we continue on right here on Locked On Cougars. Now, a word on our friends over at Perry Homes. They've worked with us for years, not years now, but months now. The best part is, is that Perry Homes is here to help you guys out no matter what you're doing with your housing situation. Whether you're looking for your first home, you're a first-time home builder, you're looking to build your dream home, or anything in between, Perry Homes is here for you. For 50 years, they got five decades of experience behind them. Perry Homes has been Utah's premier home builder with communities throughout the state. They got men in communities, home designs, and price points to help meet your needs. Like I said, they can meet you at any point wherever you are in life's journey. The best part is they got beautiful communities in Davis, Salt Lake, Tooele, and Utah counties along the Wasatch Front, where 
wherever you want to live in those communities, or if you want to get down to the southern end of the state, you want to go down to Washington County, Red Rock Country. They've got multiple communities in Washington County near St. George available to you as well. They offer over 50 unique home designs from Ramblers to two stories to townhomes as well. And they're offering generous financing incentives right now through their preferred lender. We all know the interest rates are out of control. They want to help give you a break on that front as well. So visit PerryHomesUtah.com to see what's new in Utah's uh, new finest neighborhoods. Excuse me. That's PerryHomesUtah.com. Make sure to mention the Locked On Cougar sent you when you stop by. For 50 years, Utah has been coming home to Perry Homes. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars a part of your routine. A big thank you to all of you for your support of the podcast. Uh, I'd say this often, but it's going to continue to be a refrain I use on this podcast. But uh, we still need you guys to leave your ratings, your reviews. If you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure that you hit that uh, subscribe button. Also, enable notifications. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc., please leave those ratings and reviews, especially on Apple Podcasts. Those five-star ratings are worth their weight in podcast gold. I, I don't know how to necessarily make it any clear. It's really simple tap five stars leave a sentence or two what you like about the podcast what you'd like to see improved no matter what you like uh to see done i'd love to have you guys' feedback and thank you in advance for doing just that all right couple of notes on the BYU front real quick here is congratulations to BYU uh, third baseman Austin Deming. He's made it to the NCAA D1 third team All-American by Collegiate Baseball. Uh, he's a senior for the BYU football program, recently graduated in communications with a journalism emphasis. May have to get him on this podcast to uh, see how he is uh, as a media member. But he uh, had the WCC Triple Crown this past year, 418 batting average, 19 home runs, and 68 RBIs during his 2023 season. Fantastic stuff. He led the WCC in nine offensive categories in addition to batting average, home runs, and RBI. He also led the league in slugging percentage, total bases, hits per game, RBI per game, uh, home runs per game, and doubles per game. Impressive, impressive numbers. I'm hoping that Deming gets a chance uh, at the pro level with an MLB squad. We'll see if that bat can uh, follow him into the pro ranks, but fantastic stuff, and congratulations once again to Austin Deming. As I mentioned, an old friend returning to the sidelines at BYU. It's BYU basketball. BYU BYU head coach Amber Whiting has announced the addition of assistant John, assistant coach John Wardenberg uh, to her staff. Now, many of you might recall John Wardenberg worked at BYU previously. He's returning to BYU after a 33-year coaching career that includes eight years of high school experience and 25 years at the collegiate level. Most recently, he was at Southern Virginia University, but he returns to BYU women's basketball, and I think this is a great, great pickup for Amber Whiting. Uh, he was a, get, began his coaching career as an assistant coach at Pleasant Grove High School. Uh, he worked at Dixie State, uh, working as the athletic director from 97 to 99, as an assistant to Dave Rose down there for a while from 93 to 97. Then he returned uh, to the sideline as the head coach of the Pineview High School program. And then 2001 to 2010 in Provo, he was an assistant coach under both Steve Cleveland and Dave Rose. So really, really good to see John Wardenberg coming back to BYU. And like I said, now with the women's basketball program, he will be a veteran voice that Amber Whiting can rely upon as BYU makes the leap to the Big 12. I think this is a really, really savvy pickup by Coach Whiting. Now, one of the notes is that BYU Women's Soccer has announced their 2023 20, uh, schedule. It'll start August 4th, if I'm not mistaken, with a blue and white game uh, that they will have their annual inter-squad scrimmage. Then they will play two non-conference games, excuse me, not non-conference games. They are two exhibition games. They go to Rutgers and return home to face Idaho State before the season officially kicks off. Excuse me, it'll be August 5th will be that blue and white game at Southfield. Then they'll go to uh, Rutgers on August 10th by and then follow that by hosting Idaho State on August 12th. Then they open the season at home against St. Louis on August 17th. They will be the first team. The, the official of Big 12 debut for BYU athletic program will be the women's soccer program when they open that against St. Louis on uh, August 17th. So exciting to have that uh, on our, our radar just over two months away, folks. So get excited for that. Should be a fun time. Now, the final note on today's show is we take another look back at another game in BYU football history. And today we look at a, just an absolute obliterate at the hands of the Wisconsin uh, Badgers. They came to BYU in 2017, week three of the season, uh, as the uh, number 10 team in the country. Now, BYU was excited to have Wisconsin here. Very few Big Ten teams have ever made the trip to Provo. I was in the press box that day, and I was seeing all kinds of Wisconsin Badger legends wandering around Lavelle Edwards Stadium. None more so than Barry Alvarez, who was the athletic director. And uh, I've got to say this. Barry Alvarez has a persona about him. And I, I was walking around. I actually didn't recognize who he was from behind until I saw him turn around. 
But the thing about this, he's got what they call, I call it gravitas. Just the people are just almost drawn to him. He's a legend, obviously, built the Wisconsin football program into the, the powerhouse that it's been for the better part of, what, 20 plus, 25 years now. Uh, but now he's the athletic director and doing great things at Wisconsin. But his team, speaking of Wisconsin, came into BYU that day and just laid no doubt uh, as to who the better team on the field that day was. BYU sunk to a 1-3 and three record. It was the third straight loss. Uh, as the season was just off to an abysmal start. Tanner Mangum uh, was actually ineffective in this game. Actually, no, he didn't even play in this game. Excuse me. Bo Hodge uh, was the quarterback for BYU. He was 11 of 20 for 111 yards and two interceptions. His counterpart on the opposite sideline, though, Alex Hornerbrook. Holy smokes. What a performance it was. You will recall it. 18, excuse me. 18 of 19 passing. He only had one incompletion, 256 yards, and four touchdowns. BYU could not get to this guy. It was actually kind of the first time I remember BYU fans saying, what in the world is BYU's defense doing? Why are they not sending a blitz? And I, for one, agreed with BYU fans in this circumstance. You needed to get after this guy. This Wisconsin team was ranked number 10 in the country. You needed to do something to get him off his get him off his uh, his spots, but they weren't able to do that. The, the other part about it was is Jonathan Taylor, who is now a standout running back for the Indianapolis Colts. He had a monster day as well. 18 carries, 128 yards, and one touchdown. It was just an absolute just blowout. And it started off uh, innocently enough. BYU was 3-3 in the first quarter, but then Wisconsin just laid it on. It was 24-6 to at halftime. They added uh, 16 points in the second half to make it a 40-6 to blowout. And BYU's misery and their woes continued uh, as the 2017 season, we all know, would play out in just dismal dismal fashion for the Cougars and this was the first time by the way I went back and looked at it, it I, I'm not 100% certain it was uttered the way I thought it. I remembered it being uttered but Kalani Sitake in the post game press conference of this game said I know what I have to do and what he meant by that based on what I understand uh, looking back on it now is he knew need to make it he needed to make a change with his offensive coaching staff obviously that would not come until the end of the season but uh, this was the first game I recall those that statement coming out of his mouth but uh, nonetheless we would find out later on uh, what ultimately things how things would transpire for this but Ula Tolatau if you remember him uh, actually was BYU's leading rusher in this game with 13 carries and 58 yards had a long uh, carry on the day of 18 yards actually matching Jonathan Taylor for the long run on the day but just an absolutely miserable miserable performance for BYU as their season just got off to a really bumpy start dropping to one and three and we'll talk about the next game after this an in-state rival uh Gets one up on BYU and speaking to Utah State, and we'll talk about that one on tomorrow's edition of Locked On Cougars. So that's going to do it for today's edition of the podcast. A big thank you to all of you for being our everydayers with us here on the Locked On Podcast and Locked On Cougars. Also, big thank you to all of you for making us your first listen of the day, no matter where you listen to it, by the way. Whether it's morning, noon, or night, I cannot thank you guys enough for your continued support of this venture, as always. And until tomorrow, have a great rest of your day, my friends. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.